Um, welcome to web attacks and defensive strategies and other things. Um, I put this together as a, a tech talk because people have been wanting to see the defensive side of some of the, the red team stuff that we've been presenting. So I'm going to try to go back and forth on this one a little bit on each different type of vulnerability and kind of try to put the whole picture together. I know most people in the Charleston area are there's just little pockets of offensive security here and there. So I really like to bring something that people can bring home to their jobs or their hobbies. So a little bit about me. I've been doing IT system engineering for about 12 years now, for the last eight specialized in, in just security. So I've been, I've been all over the place, seen a lot of different types of systems. I've been the, the guy that's stuck on one system for a couple years, and I've been the guy that walks in and, and sees it brand new on day one and has to fix it in you know, 30 or 90 days as a consultant. So I've seen and done a lot of different things. Right now I'm working for the VA. That's the job that we're, we're advertising for, doing an application pen testing for a very large web application that in total makes up maybe 2 million lines of code. What's the same application? It's VBMS. So veterans benefit. It's not something that veterans directly interface with. But I'm not a highly educated individual. Um, I'm working on my bachelor's right now, and I'm not a professional speaker. Um, I am decidedly a very unprofessional speaker. So if you don't like something I say, just throw something. So getting started. I wanted to cover some stuff for maybe the less experienced in the people in the room. So we're going to cover a little bit of web architecture and, and what that really means and what you need to think about when you're doing an application pen test, where we came from and where we're going. So, you know, it all it all started 25 or 30 odd years ago when you were just making a, a direct connection to a web server out on the internet and it really stuck that way for a long time where you would you didn't have a lot to worry about as far as, you know, if you were a hacker or if you were someone just using the internet, there was not a lot of stuff in the way. You just, you know, dial up the, your favorite website and uh, life was very simple. So once, once people realized that they didn't want to have to have, uh, you know, static updates for their, their hit counter and things like that, people started adding more complexity to the internet. So we got databases. Um, got uh, web application firewalls, proxies, regular firewalls. We eventually decided that websites were getting too big and getting too complex and we needed to spread the load out because one big monolithic mainframe type server just couldn't cut it anymore. So we started doing load balancer, we started having more back-end processing, more back-end resource systems. Um, and it, it kind of hovered that way for another you know, handful of eight, ten years. And then people started getting into the the real JavaScript, Ajax, having web 2.0 stuff, and what we now, not me, but other people are calling mashups. So where you might be pulling data from a different, a completely different domain, a different data center, you don't even really know where it's coming from as the, as the end user. You just go to a website, and you're getting stuff from all over the place. And you don't, as a normal user, you don't need to know that. But as a, an application pen tester, that can be really, really important. Once we sort of progressed past the web 2.0 simplistic side of it, and things started getting more complex, we progressed to the cloud, as I said. Um, where you may not know what data center your data is coming from. I said Rob didn't answer So, and you don't really need to know as an end user. It's set up to make it as simple as possible for the people who are using these as a user. But that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to attack these targets. And we need to know exactly what you're attacking. <coughs> so the question is, in this picture, what are you attacking? When you're looking at a target, whether you're a black hat, or whether you're a white hat, or a blue hat, um, you need to know what you're attacking. Um, so it is very critical as a pen tester to understand the scope of your targets, where the complexities behind the systems are, 
and understand where the data is going that you are sending and receiving from that system. You don't want to get into a pen test, whether you're doing it as a job or whether you're doing it as part of like a bug crowd environment where you get to go out and you know hack on websites for fun and actual profit. Um, you don't want to be attacking Twitter because it was getting pulled into your clients for your targets. That's, that's very important. So I'm just going to uh, cover these things real quick, so the good stuff. The next thing you need to understand as an attacker is the basics of the web communications. We, uh, we all know what it is. How many times have you typed that in your life? All right. So it's essentially, that's the, the bulk of everything that gets done on the internet right now. All of the web technologies are converging on um, simpler communications and utilizing other types of protocols to add complexities later. So there are a lot of different types of technologies out there, but the vast majority of, of traffic is still HTTP and a lot of SMTP. HTTP. So what, what does HTTP really mean? What does it do? Um, it's something that we need to dissect and further understand so that you can figure out how you want to make it work the way you want it to work as opposed to the way that the web target thinks you're going to use it. So you need to understand that there are a lot of less talked about features of the HTTP protocol. Um, the HTTP protocol uses what they call methods, and you know the most common one that was widely used since the dawn of time is the get method. <coughs> This is the, the basic web request um, that is as simple as it gets. And you see these all over the internet today, and they'll probably never go away just because it's so easy and simple to use. Um, it started out in the very beginning that if you wanted to request information from the server you used to get, and if you wanted to put information on a server you used to post. And things changed a little bit over time changed a lot over time once the hackers got involved. The biggest problems with the get and post are they are, well the biggest problem with the get is that any variables, any parameters that are supplied are sent in the URL. So you can see like that question mark V, you can see exactly what your browser is asking the server for. And since HTTP is only a request and response protocol, there is no way for the get for the HTTP get request to understand anything outside of that. All of the encryption, all of the session management, and all of the authentication are handled with other parts of the web traffic. So HTTP is completely stateless and request and responsible. So once people realized that get was not necessarily the best way to pass parameters, they started transitioning more over the post. So a post request, a post login can look just like the one on the bottom. You never see the parameters as a normal user. Um, the parameters are still there, and we'll cover that in greater detail later. But it's not, it takes a little bit more effort to get to <coughs> modify them and subvert them to your code. So how many people in this room know that there are other parameters for HTTP methods, other methods? So just like the FTP, HTTP came with a put for file transfers. Um, nobody uses it anymore. I don't think I've ever seen it used in my career. Anybody ever seen it used? Yeah. It has a delete. Um, it has options. Delete's pretty self-explanatory. It has options that'll tell you some stuff about the server, what the server can handle as far as the HTTP methods. So if you're a, if you're a good server administrator, you're going and you disable all of these except for get and post, then well, options will work. But if you disable log and forget post and options, then it'll tell you that it's, that it's limited. Um, there's a trace command, which can be really useful as an attacker. This will tell you everything within reason 
that's between you and the destination server. So if you're trying to figure out why your um, exploits aren't working properly against a certain target, you can use the trace command and you can try and figure out what is between you. Maybe there's a firewall, maybe just some, you know, a lot of different routing. And, you know, it's not, it's not a precise science, there's a little bit of black magic in there, but you can usually tell when things are, are going bad because of some kind of firewall or IPS. Um, another one is the head method. This is a way to pull just the HTTP headers down, just to get the parameters without getting the actual whole web page. And this can be useful just for, for testing tools and can be useful when you're just trying to do reconnaissance and, and figure things out about the server. Um, it you know, reduces your amount of traffic. People have used this in you know, back channel communications. It's, it can be versatile, but it's just something you don't hear about very much. Um, so once you, you know, put a little bit of thought into learning what methods you want to use on a, on a particular engagement, you can actually really speed up the attack process just by understanding how the server is, is functioning on the back end. Um, and part of that is just understanding the HTTP status codes. Every time you get a, a response back from the server, it's going to include the HTTP status. And well, you, you don't need to memorize the individual status numbers except for a couple of them. You know, everybody knows what a 404 is, I think. And there's a lot of very unique ones in there that you really never see. But just knowing what the codes are, you can kind of tell where problems are happening. If your exploit is not working, if the page isn't loading properly, if it's going somewhere where you don't want it to load, the status codes can kind of clue you in on, on what's going wrong. So that's just something else that is a little bit outside of the scope of this, but I wanted to include it because it can really help in troubleshooting. And we'll get a little bit more into that later. So, part three, the good part. So, okay, as an application pen tester, what exactly are we looking we don't have a, a guideline like the ever-present this is dig to go down and give you a checklist of a web application's vulnerabilities or configuration items. So what do we turn to to figure out where to look? Maybe you don't have maybe you don't have Fortify. Maybe you can't afford a hundred thousand dollar Fortify license. We turn to the OWASP project, which is the open web application security project, um, and they have a top 10 list of the top 10 worst vulnerabilities for the web as a whole for, for each year, and their, their 2014 stuff is not out yet, but 2013, I mean, the, the 10 items on the top 10 really haven't changed in about eight years. They just kind of shuffle around a little bit, um, but the same, you know, the same top six are all over there. So if you want to get better or get into the application pen testing, cannot live without the OWASP project, just the best resource ever. This is the 2013 top 10, um, and we're going to cover number one, three, and eight in this class. Um, so you can kind of see the, the things that are an example. And they go, even their website goes very deep into how to exploit and test the vulnerabilities. So, and protect And protect against them. Because that's the key here, right? Because most of us are blue teamers. How many people in this room are red team? Nobody. So, yeah, there's not a lot of red here for us. So, if they were here, they would not identify us. Right. That's right. So, we're trying to secure the websites. Um, so, we're going to start off with command injection. This is a very simple vulnerability that often gets overlooked by developers grow up as a developer, and I'm not trying to harp on developers too much because you don't always get the perspective that you need when you go into a computer science degree and you learn programming and you spend four years programming and you get out and get a job programming and you never step aside to learn how the operating system works, how the network works. It just happens that way sometimes. And a lot of times developers don't get the, the training that they need once they're on the job because they're just cranking out code. Functionality and deadlines are the only thing that they're told to worry about. So nobody ever pulls them aside and says, you need to worry about command injection on a, a simple web application. But this is something that we see all the time. When 
you go to a, a web form and you type in a any type of you know search term or command that you're trying to execute on that form, and you get an error message back that looks something sort of like that. Those huge sirens and red flags and bells and whistles that tell you that you have command injection there. And this is about as simple as it gets of an example, but somebody tell me why this is a red flag right here. So what's the what's the keyword up there? Which, well, you've got a direct uh, direct input to the bash. Right. Exactly. I mean the commands uh, yep. processor. And the website is passing commands directly to a bash shell, and we have seen this in non-production systems. I'm sure it happens all the time in production, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit more about how we saw it. But this is telling you that those commands are getting passed directly to the bash shell, and it's not something they expected. So, you know, the next command, the next thing I'm going to search for is what's my present working directory? Um, what type of system am I running on? And the website is just going to happily return all this stuff because it's only doing what somebody told it to do. Um, you know, you're only limited by your imagination. I can think of some things that I would like to get from that server, you know, were I an attacker. Um, I thought Chris was going to Get pretty creative as far as command injection. But wait, there's more. One other type of command injection that I've seen, actually two other types that I've seen, one is passed in the URL. So they may have a, a web form that naturally passes some kind of directory listing or some other command in the URL. And you can just replace it out and put whatever command you want. So that's just like the last one. But one is a little bit more complex and subtle that it's harder to see on a black box test where you don't get the insides, but if you have source code, if you're doing white box or, or gray or crystal, whatever they call it these days, a lot of times developers and, and system administrators will use text files for configuration commands for things such as the Java Virtual Machine. Um, you know, I'm not sure if there's anything you can do with .NET on that, but when you see parameters passed to the system or pulled, pulled in from a text file, all you have to do is alter the parameters a little bit. You can you can end the parameters for that and start up your own command. Um, you know, so we saw one where you can alter the text file, and the next time the Java virtual machine restarts, the next time the application is restarted, you just you know and can turn that cat out of shell to your IRC server somewhere. Um, and it's bad news. So it's a it's very simple but very powerful, and it's something that is really easy as a, as a beginning pen tester. It's really easy to get in and look at that type of stuff because once you learn Linux commands, I mean, the rest is just your imagination. So how do you defend against something like this? It's not a, you know, in the example of our, of our Google web form, it's not a search box where you are expecting any type of thing as a developer. You know if you're expecting first name, last names, they're not going to get passed to the bash shell. If you're looking for bash commands to be passed over directly, then the odds are you are expecting some type of system command for the operating system that you're running on. So the best way, in my own opinion, is to provide more of a menu system where you're not allowing users to choose what commands are getting run. You don't want them to be able to type in a command and have to execute directly on the operating system. Give them a menu, do not give them a drop down list. Give them something where they can push number one or you know, select from a list that is checked server side so that it does not make it through into the shell. And that also applies to command line options, right? Because that was the one that we found. Is that they were allowing options to be input through the UI, and therefore you, know, you could sort of just escape out of the original command and run whichever one you want because it was just going to end your options at the end of the command. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you can you can add a you know you can uh, do the alligator <laughs> do the alligator for that command into a text file and then start another command. You can the hype symbol. You can do whatever you want. Um, so limiting limiting the users from being able to type in whatever they want in some method is really the best defense against this. Um, so 
is, is very similar to uh, SQL injection, which we'll come back to later. So now we're going to cover uh, cross-site scripting. Also known Can you start as, back from the beginning? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so cross-site scripting, also known as um, pop-up one. This is this was number one. Yeah, this was number one on the OWASP pop up and it's it's always on there because it is it's easily one of the most powerful um, attacks that you can do. And it's it's one of the ones that's very easy as a beginning pen tester to, to get a handle on and to start messing around with. And it is everywhere. It's very hard to defend against, and it is it is very complex to um, defend against it completely. So let's go over it. So on your on your standard web form, you you enter a search term, and it gets sent to the server and sent back. The, the server processes it and sends it back to the client. So for cross-site scripting to work, well, let me back up. There are a few different types of cross-site scripting. When we, when we started out, when people discovered this, they named them as reflective, reflected and stored cross-site scripting. Those were the two types. Now, reflected means it's something that is sent from the user to the server and back to the user. There's your reflection. And there may be some complexity in there where it goes out in another place cover that later, but it, it is reflected back to the user from, the, from himself or herself. And stored is, this was very common in the early days of PHPDB, anything where users can upload data that's permanently stored, like a form. I enter something in here that's nasty, and the server saves it, and later on, I send an email to Tim and say, hey Tim, go check out this forum post I did. When he pulls up that page, the server loads what I had stored, and it executes the cross-site script. You know, it's very easy to proof of concept cross-site scripting with a pop-up one. Everybody does that because it's quick and dirty, and it, it shows that the vulnerability is there without putting too much work to it. But cross-site scripting is immensely powerful because you have the whole entire JavaScript and essentially HTML web language set at your disposal. Anything that you can do, as long as it's about, as long as the the character space that you have to submit is longer than maybe 18 characters, you can you can pretty much do anything you want. Um, it's limited to 18 characters because you need to be able to call the URL from your own server, your very short domain, like like b.cn. You know, if you get up to the 25 characters length, or since most people don't put limits on their web forms at all. You can call anything you want. You know, essentially, you can dump a whole JavaScript file into a web form. You know, or we'll cover, cover tools a little bit more later, but you can use something like Burp Suite to catch a request in progress, change kerfluffle to something else. So later on, people realized that there was a third type of cross-site scripting, and they called it DOM cross-site scripting, DOM XSS. DOM is the document object model. For anybody who's familiar with JavaScript, it's the way that JavaScript looks at what the browser is doing with the web page. So everything on the page, all of these things are objects, and each one has a specific identifier within the browser, within the JavaScript, so that you can use JavaScript to alter anything on the page at any time. So DOM XSS is neither stored nor reflected. It executes directly in the browser and never leaves the victim system. Some people have now transitioned a little bit to just calling them server-side XSS and client-side XSS. I would imagine that those will probably proliferate a little bit more as, as it gets more widely accepted. Um, DOM XSS is not widely understood right now because it's a new-ish vulnerability, especially as far as XSS goes. Um, so not a lot of people, not a lot of websites try to prevent this. And you really, you really need a, a JavaScript it does the browser have a little bit of defense on that means it won't let you do something in that one page unless it came from the same site so there's a there's a few protections you're, you're talking about the same origin policy so same origin policy says 
it's got to come from the same domain. It's got to come from the same level of encryption, so HTTPS or not. <coughs> it's got to come from the same port. Um, you know, so it checks a few things to say that it's coming from the same server that I think it's coming from. Um, and there are many ways of making it more impossible. Yeah, and I think the browser allows them to talk. The two parts of talk, if they agree. Yes, it does. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, you can mark, um, like if you're, if you're trying to get a cookie, you can mark cookie secure or HTTP only, so the JavaScript can't get to your session. Um, most of the modern browsers have XSS protection features built in. The problem there, just like every blue teamer in the world knows, is that the browser developers have to predict every form of broken XSS ever. And they're always, they're always behind the power curve. Why? Why are the browser developers always behind the power curve? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but to, uh, to uh, say what he was um, talking about, same origin policy, there's a recent Android vulnerability added to uh, Metasploit yep. at Exploit 7. Just yeah. wanted to point out. And same origin policy is really good, but <clears throat> to answer my own question, they're always behind the power curve because they are required to do um, lazy interpretation of bad HTML and bad web languages. So you can take anybody off the street and give them a 30 minute HTML class and the browsers will properly interpret that. So when your tags are messed up, your quotes are mismatched and everything is broken, the web page still displays fairly well. And they do that by allowing terrible broken code to be interpreted in the way that they think it should look. So the XSS, the vulnerability researchers, are able to find little things like putting three double quotes in a row and then finishing the tag. And, you know, and, and we'll go over some examples of that. Um, but it, it's, it's pretty difficult to defend against XSS that way. Um, so, all right, so there's that. If you're looking to do reflected cross-site scripting, then you're going to circumvent or you're going to attack that connection right there. You want to get in between the first request and the server because it has to be it has to hit the server first and then come back to the client. A lot of times what you see in in pen tests and less experienced pen testers is they'll they'll use some of the tools and perform an XSS attack on themselves that was never sent to the server and back. So it, it looks great on paper but you could never exploit it against a victim because it wasn't sent to the server, right? So it, in order to be reflected, it must go there. Now, if you want to worry about that report at all, <laughs> I'm, I'm not bitter. Um, so that's, that's reflected. And then stored is the other direction. You need to get something onto the server that can later be pulled up in a web page. Um, so this is, a, a generic Google web search. And this is this is a function of JavaScript I learned yesterday, having the, the hashtag instead of the question mark. Um, I've never seen that before. Everybody else uses a question mark right there, and then you know what the parameter name is, and then you'll see rows of, of parameters. So now Google doesn't allow this, and I wouldn't advise trying it, but to execute cross-site scripting in the most basic form. You just change what that parameter is. And it's sent to the server. The server does no filtering whatsoever and sent back to the client. So when, when this is sent back to the client, right there, the page refreshes and it rereads the code. So instead of saying kerfluffle, it now says kerfluffle script alert one and you get your one pop-up box. And that is still very widely in place. If you start doing web pen tests, that, is, that right there is your test because if they're not seasoned developers, seasoned security developers, it's gonna work. Um, once people realize, once IDS manufacturers and web application firewall manufacturers realize that people were running script tags and parameters they took them out of the, you know, blocked them in the network stream or blocked them in the application proxy, and people started to get creative, and this is where XSS really took off. By, 
please remind me. I think I, I read the chipmunk book, the HTTP chipmunk book. So if I remember right, before the blank line, it had all the parameters and stuff that we would see with question marks. And then after the blank line, it would have what would be an HTML page. Uh, and so what I think you were just saying is that it'll take what would have been part of the HTML page, put it right up into the, uh, the script, all those uh, fields? Sort of. Sort of. Sort of. And I'll, I'll, we'll come back okay. to that and I'll show you exactly what it's doing. So people started getting creative and coming up with new ways to perform XSS. As everything gets blocked, it's playing whack-a-mole, new ones come up, and they're always more creative and, and much more difficult to defend against. Um, this one is excellent, and I wish it wasn't off the edge of the screen, but, but what it says is, um, you know, the, the search term is kerfluffle, and quotes, angle brackets, angle brackets, we're opening up a new image tag. So when, when the browser sees this come back from the server, it doesn't know that this is not coming from the server. It just says, okay, that's finished. I'm going to start a new image tag with the source of the Z. And it's going to put the little, you know, broken image box there because Z is meaningless. And the on error is alert in brackets one. Um, so it's going to do exactly that. But we didn't need to put the script tags in there. We're giving it properly formatted HTML with no script tags. all the time. So when you really, when you don't have a lot of room and you want to do something fancy like an actual hack, you've got to call out to a different location to pull in more script. Because unless they're really bad and not filtering their, their text inputs at all, most people at least put some size, some size limitations on their form fields. So you're not going to put a last name in that's 10,000 characters. Typically, for the sake of development speed, a lot of people don't put limits on there, so you know, your mileage may vary. But if you want to do the really interesting stuff, you call out to another location, and you can do the you can do the same type of thing with this. This says xss.js close tag there. So you call out to another location, and it'll do the exact same thing. You can put this in your on error tag. So where you go from here as a beginner is back to the OWASP project. They have the XSS filter evasion cheat sheet. I cannot stress that enough. It's just hundreds and hundreds of examples of broken HTML and broken JavaScript that the browsers may or may not know is cross-site scripting. Um, and it's a, it's a process of going through and, you know, if, if my alert one doesn't work, but I feel like maybe there's something there because I can see bad stuff happening, unexpected stuff happening, then I'll get more and more complex with the attacks that I'm throwing at it until I find something that works. Typically, I have I have burp suite open, so I'm, I'm catching. And there's there's a few other different different application proxies: burp suite, Zed attack proxy, we call it Zap, and Rap proxy. Those are the three biggies. So you have one of those open, and you're looking at the requests and stopping it in the middle. So I hit send. I hit go on the browser, and burp pops up and little red light that says, you know, intercept it. And I look at that and I say, okay, I want to change this parameter. And I type it in, <coughs> type it in and say forward and burped in forwards that request with my altered parameter to the server. And then intercepts the response on the way back. So I can look at the response and then say forward and let that go to the client. And so it's it's a process of going through that over and over again, iterating until you find exactly how you want to do it and exactly where it work. There are a lot of tools to play and learn in XSS. Start out with Burp Suite Free Edition. Start out with, with Firefox and put the Firebug extension on. Every browser has a Java console or a JavaScript console, but Firebug is by far the most powerful. The, the extension called Hackbar is very good. There's an extension called XSSME that's also very good. And you keep adding things, these things on and on and on, and, and pretty soon your browser looks like that with about one inch of of Windows space, but you can just go through pages and, and catch everything. You know, there's one specialized for the DOM XSS now. Um, those are starting to get real popular. So, as you're looking through all these, and to come back to your question, Walter, right? Um, we're good. As you're sending these attacks and catching them in Burp Suite, that's not really what the browser sees. 
So that's, that's being translated in this raw HTML, but you don't always know how the browser is going to interpret that. And you don't, you don't always know if it's going to make it through like the Chrome XSS filter. So what you do is you, you send your attack, you wait for the response, you look at it and work, and then you look at the source code. The source code is going to tell you exactly what's happening. Because that is, that is what the browser sees and what the browser is trying to display. So this is this is one that actually worked on a, on a little test site that I was, just like a learning site um, that I was messing around with in order for this class to get it together. So the input type is text, the value is, is kerfluffle, but I added the rest. So from that quote, all the way over to there is what I put in. So I know this one works because I tested it, but this is what you're looking for. You open it up and you're going to look at the source code for one web form, you know, 25, 50, 100 times, just narrowing it down from something that's simple like this all the way into something that's three double quotes, then an angle bracket, then, you know, breaking out of the tag that you're in and starting a new tag. That, that's really the key um, process that you're looking for. I need to end that tag. I need to break out so that I can insert what I want to do. And <laughs> so there's some examples of some more complex cross-site scripting that you pick from the filter evasion cheat sheet. Now, I wouldn't know I wouldn't know how to do that. Like I don't I don't memorize every XSS attack. But different encoding types, depending on what your target does, you know, maybe they're in a different country and they use different different encoding types for the pages, you know, maybe different web technologies, different things, and you can figure out, maybe through your HTTP options, um, different encoding types. Um, this is an embedded tab character for white space into the middle of the job a script, and that works. The browser will interpret that, because the browser doesn't care what a tab character is. Right on going. So it's it's extremely powerful. I'm going to break out of the presentation for one second here and show you an actual XSS exploit that I learned about today that I thought was amazing. as plain text and not executed as HTML or JavaScript or any other type. 
web language. Now, I say do not check it in JavaScript because of all the things that we just went over with the, the JavaScript console, Firebug, all those, all those methods of, of disabling form fields, I can go in there and delete one character out of the current running page and undo all of the security work that you just did. So your form fields are not going to allow X. I'm going to go in and say, let me put in X. Put in submit, and you'll never know. And you'll say, well, the JavaScript is protecting it. It's really not, because JavaScript is customizable on the user side. All right, so if you like JavaScript filtering, put it there for usability. You want, you want the fancy form fields that, that have a, a phone number example until you click in it, that's all done in JavaScript, and that's great. But it's only for usability. The security side must be implemented on the server. So that's, that's the strongest method. Now, if you don't want to get into the arguments of limiting the characters that you're allowed to put in, there are other options. Um, the primary one that I, that I like to use is strongly typing your strong, strong data types on your variables. If you're bringing data in and you know it's a string, treat it as a string. If it's a number, treat it as an int or a long or a decimal, whatever you want to take it as. Or if you absolutely need to, um, we had this debate yesterday because the, the laws of database something or other say that you don't want to treat numbers that are never going to be operated on with mathematical calculations as numbers. You want to treat them as strings because that's the law. So treat it as a string, but have your developers put in the due diligence to, to check those that they look valid and don't include the characters, or maybe cast them to a string later. You know, do, yeah. do some type of operation on there so that if you're inserting yuck into a web form, somebody is going to see that or it's going to break. There are many ways of, of doing that. And every step forward is, is going to protect your application. I was going to say, I think one of the things you mentioned at the key is uh, when I did development for State War years ago, our mantra was all user input is equal. Yeah, so basically, you don't trust anything that's coming in from the client side. Yeah, that's um, a good mantra. You know, and and would, that, that, would, that served us well for eight years straight. Um, I would add to that that it's not just users, it's, it's partners and well, you know, yeah, I mean, any, any input that's coming that into your not, application yeah. is not to be trusted. Most people in this room understand, you know, the DoD concept of a security boundary. So anything that is not from your home, don't trust it. You know, just do something. Sometimes even stuff that is inside the boundary. Let's not forget that persistent attacks can yeah. make standard data tables and other kinds of sources that you would normally think are trusted all nasty. So a lot of times, everything. A lot of times, uh, my idea goes from if it's a, a noun type piece of data, it cannot transition to a verb. Action executable. Right. If I like that before, that's a boundary. Time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of the most popular libraries for Java applications is the OWASP project Stinger. And it's not in active development anymore, which is kind of sad because it's not quite polished, but it's kind of the best out there. It's the most polished of the, the Java type stuff. And it, it will do. It does a server that will check all of your form inputs for you, but the developers have to go through and make the regexes that say this form input from this page is allowed these characters and nothing else. And somebody has to go back through with business requirements and the testers and everything to make sure that it does what, what you want it to do and what you think it's going to do. Regexes are voodoo. And if you don't test them a hundred times, it's questionable. Any questions on XSS? Did I cover anything really fast? All right, moving on to SQL injection. Or one equals one. SQL injection, going back to our, our simple diagram, we are now attacking the database server. SQL for the newer people in the room, you could know is structured query language and I is injection. So we don't really care what's between us and the database server. The, the server is helpful and the server can offer filters and you, know, you can have web application firewalls, IDS systems, 
All that stuff is kind of ancillary to, can I get into the database server? Can I attack that guy right there? So we're going to look a little bit deeper. Hands. Hands. And you see that the database, once you learn database as well, you realize that it's just an application running on top of an operating system like any other application. People just make it into something scary and weird because they, you know, could less horrible ones. But it's it's still accepts user input just like we just finished talking about, like anything else, and it expects it in a certain format. And when you vary from that format, you're performing some kind of injection, whether it's malicious or whether it's just accidental. Um, if anybody has never seen a, a database schema before. We are going to cover each one of these points in detail. <laughs> so that, that's our Facebook page. Uh, I guess the internet. So, <laughs> no, so the database is, you know, the database is made up of tables. Each one of these is a table. And you know, each one of the, the rows is a column in the table, and the, the top one being the primary key. So all of these lines are relationships of one way or another. It'll say something like the primary key from this table, you know, maps to the user ID on this. <coughs> so all the relationship lines and everything. And when it comes down to SQL injection, you have no idea about any of that. And typically, the DBA is only barely understand it. So, <laughs> so you're looking at this from a completely black box, black box perspective most of the time. Even if you're doing a white box test, getting a SQL schema map out of the DBAs is worse than pulling teeth. I mean, those guys are around on themselves. So, yeah. So this is a simple SQL query. And they tried to make it as English-like as possible, and it's Across different vendors, they're sort of the same, but you need to learn the variances between the different database vendors. But it's just saying, select the ID from the user's table, where the username is dcorsi and the password is kerfuffle, and there's a, another single quote on the end of that. Um, all this is doing is getting, getting my user ID, which is one, from the column. So when this gets put into an application, you're not going to know what the username and the password is. So the developers have to do something to get that from the application into the query. So early learning developers build a string. A string object is just a bunch of letters in a row. And they inject something from a form field into the string and assign it to a string variable and pass that string variable to a SQL server as a query. And it, it's simple, it gets the job done, you know, it's exploitable. If, if for this for this exact query, if those are the values that we pass, it's going to select my ID of one and return that to the web page. And the web page is going to say, okay, we have user ID now of one, and we can use that user ID for whatever type of logic we want to use. Maybe it's a login, maybe it's you know looking up user preferences, and you can pull from then on, you're doing all of your operations based on user ID. So if you mistype your password, when it tries to do the select, it doesn't, it doesn't find it because your password doesn't match. So it doesn't find any rows that match those values. So you don't get logged in or you know, you, yeah, I did this as a login scheme, so you don't get logged in. So if you're trying to do SQL injection, again, we always go back to the most simple attacks first. What happens if you put these values in? What happens if you go to Facebook and log in as admin? foo or one equals one with a single quote and those are two dashes, it's kind of blurry. Who knows what that does? Put your hand up. I think the idea is that it makes another command that, uh, like the or would have been part of the select condition. You're, you're very close though. It's all part of, it all becomes part of this string right here. Basically it negates what the password has to be. Right, because yeah, so, you put it true in the so, yeah. One is one is always true. So <coughs> what you're saying is log me in as user where the username is admin and the password is foo and that, that single quote 
appends that password field. So user is admin and password equals foo or yes, just do it. Technically a strong password. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then the two dashes, that is a Microsoft SQL comment. So that's just saying anything that, anything after that, just forget about it. You don't need to worry about that stuff. Um, so now you get the you get a SQL query that says just go ahead and log me in no matter what my password is. And when you're not filtering, I you know I would not advise it. I would not advise it. But this stuff is all over the internet. Unless you have done the, the research to look into SQL injection or your application, it's just going to work. If you did some of those tests, did your name or your IP address sort of list if they're setting up? No. Well, absolutely. If, if it's getting logged. Um, you know, there's, there's a million variables in there. If they're doing log, if someone's looking at the logs, um, what type of logging they're doing, what the logic actually does. Um, when I used to be a developer, I would, on, on sensitive forms, I would make it so that I would have multiple levels of logging. Everybody does that. <coughs> Just, you know, highlight key things, like we're getting SQL injection here that would show up on a, you know, a higher visibility monitoring system. If you're going to grandpa's lawnmower repair, you're not going to be able to see it. If you're doing it on Facebook, I would probably pack your things and just give it to <laughs> Just, yeah, <laughs> just go sign up for BugCrowd first. BugCrowd is a, an open world web application testing group that will pay you to find vulnerabilities in other people's sites. Now, the company has to join the BugCrowd program authorize you to, to do that, but it's, it, you know, the, the question mark, question mark, profit, you can now actually profit from doing this stuff and learn at the same time for, you know, or anybody who just wants to get better. So, the one, or, the one equals one is not a magic string. Just like with the XSS stuff, all the IDS developers and firewall developers immediately realize that, okay, one equals one, no one's ever going to use that, so let's block it. So put anything in there. Be creative. That's always going to equal that. You know, anything that just goes to true. Now, if you if you were to switch that, either of those, and put it on the user side, then and if you take off the, I mean, you can you can leave the comment there. Just leave the comment. So just select all from users where username is everybody. It's just going to dump you back a list of users. Yes. Since you're such a valuable resource as a developer, I would always substitute for space some other character in passwords so that, that would, you wouldn't be able to do that for that specific thing. But other than that, yeah, it's a good example. Yeah. Is there a mind single equivalent of the uh, dot dot from the NSSP? From the end? From the dash dash? Yeah, it's just like that in MySQL as well. Yeah, they all have comments. I think my SQL is dash dash. It is. Oracle's got the other one, which is a semicolon, I think, or yeah. something weird. Or I think we're all got a semicolon. Yeah. yeah. So those are the two, the only two that I agree with. I think they work so a <laughs> So SQL injection is an extremely powerful <laughs> attack. <laughs> SQL injection is I mean, it's the keys of the kingdom. When you find out that you're sending commands to the database server and they're not being filtered, it's over. You get anything you want. Um, we just gave an example of authentication bypass. Right? You just log in as a user. You can use SQL injection to read and write files for the operating system. Right? So you can read anything you want through built-in SQL commands. I have two fat SQL books at home that I use when I was a developer, but now I, I look at them for, for attack strings. Um, you can upload files. Can anybody think of a, a bad file that you wouldn't want uploaded to your, your PHP website? Maybe a, a PHP shell? For those of you who aren't familiar, a PHP shell is two files that you upload and then you browse to those files and it is just as powerful as the bash shell but it's running on your website. So now you can do anything that you can do with the bash command line from the web page. Just let someone upload that to your server. You can modify Java updater. Thanks, Java. You can modify transactions during the process. So if you're if you're a really targeted attack and you want to take down the SQL servers of the stock market, 
you don't want to know to do it. You just want to take you know, a couple of pennies, a couple of pennies here. <laughs> you don't seem to notice. Yeah, fractions of a penny. You don't seem to notice. Um, you modify transactions in progress and take your fractions of a penny. You can add users. I'm not sure why that would ever be bad, but you can add users. You can delete logs. You can. How many people know that you can port scan through SQL injection? by calling SQL strings, SQL commands, built into the server. It's all, it's all select, like it's, SQL has a built-in way to scan for other SQL servers on the network. So you can tell it, go talk to this SQL server at this IP address on this port, and it'll okay. come back and say connection time now. Database link. Yep, so, okay, well it's not there. Let's try the next port. No, all right, let's try one more port. All right, one more port. One more port. You get the idea. And then my favorite, you can get direct interaction with the OS on every SQL Server vendor. Um, Microsoft SQL Server <coughs> has this nice built-in store procedure called XP Command Shell. And as a DBA, it's really powerful. You can, you can do things with your server that you really shouldn't be able to do. And as an attacker, you really shouldn't be able to do. Um, luckily, it's disabled by default on my SQL Server 2005 and greater. Sad things, right? But not so sad. You just run this command and it re enables it. And since they're not filtering SQL anyway, I mean, it's over again. So, all the built in store procedures, you can, you can use all of the built in store procedures and tables to fingerprint the entire database. SQL Server, SQL injection is very specific to the, the vendor server that you're running on. So Oracle commands aren't going to work on MS SQL commands. You need to you need to do the research on the query language, and you need to do the the research on how you fingerprint that server. Getting finding out what exact server, what version you're running on, takes a little bit of work because you got to keep sending commands at it to figure out where the built-in system tables are, where the you know the fact that Postgres allows you to just select a, a, a system command without having to use a store procedure. Just send that command to it. Um, you know, you just you just open the back door right back to your Chinese website. Um, so, how do we find SQL injection? What do we do to, to find these things when you're just looking at a black box web application? You have no idea of what it's doing. Because not every not every server or not every web server runs SQL, right? Just start throwing stuff at it. Just put stuff in the forms that, that looks like SQL. It doesn't even have to be valid format. Just throw junk at it until it makes faces at you. And eventually, you're going to get it to throw up an error message when you get something that is a valid SQL, a valid but broken SQL query. And this is terribly blurry up here. But this is telling you, um, you know, unclosed question mark. This is, this is a, a SQL injection error. So once you see this stuff, then you know exactly what version you're running because the error message, thankfully, always includes the server version to, to help us out. So you, you, know, you start running your, uh, your exploit code on that now. So this is, this is traditional SQL injection. You beat on it until you figure out something that is back there. Once you figure out what's back there, then you start sending attack strings to find out what are the tables? How many columns do I have in this table? I'm trying to do an insert, so I insert with one column as a one, and then that didn't work. So I insert with two columns with one comma two, that didn't work. So now I try with strings, and you, you just figure out, you do all these little things. Again, it's lots of iterations, with little changes over time, and it can take a really long time, or it cannot take a long time. When you want to start doing serious testing of a SQL server. SQL map is your absolute best friend. And one of the big benefits that this provides over you banging on the keyboard is this will take care of blind SQL injection as well. Maybe you didn't get that error message back. Maybe the, maybe the web developers are good, and the, but they just don't know about SQL injection. So all their error messages go to a custom error page with a little sad guy that says, oh, we're sorry, something broke. But you don't get to know what type of SQL server is back there. So you bust out SQL map and you, you take it to the login page and you tell it, you know, here's my target server, here are the parameters it's looking for, and you basically give it a URL just like a GET request, 
or whatever type of request that server is expecting. And it will iterate through all of that stuff for you and find the, the functional SQL exploit string. So SQL map is very largely black magic. It does stuff to the server that I had never heard of until I started looking at it. It does this character by character, sending queries and asking, is this character between 1 and 64 for its ASCII code? Yes. Is it between 1 and 32? No. Between 33 and 64? Yes. So for every character, it does that. And you can you run the command line, you can watch it build this stuff out as it figures them out. It's almost like a like a movie where you know where it's going, hacking the password, and you can see the, the characters getting built out. <laughs> so you just, you just let it run and you come back, you know, and, and sometimes it doesn't work, but you will be shocked at how many times SQL map gets the job done. Um, it'll find it. It is is very, very well written, not difficult to use. Um, you can go home and practice tonight, not a good So All that, all that so manual SQL injection training now wasted. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a tool that does all those yeah. matter joint sequence for it. Yep. So is that like control fuzzing, basically? The way yeah. SQL map works? Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of you know, instead of using something like um, FuzzDB and throwing a bunch of random strings at it, it's just type focus control fuzzing, and it just goes through and says, you know, well, FuzzDB's objective is to buffer overflow the seek of the actual <coughs> server, right? Not, or is it to no, fuzz find DB, the FuzzDB is just a bunch of lists, a bunch of everything. So if you want to, if you want to attack a, a web page with common passwords, you could load your own password list. You could take those five million passwords from old Gmail accounts that just came out <laughs> and take those into Burp Suite run Burp Intruder and take the Gmail account and password and have Burp Intruder iterate through every single one. So it'll take the first one and try all the passwords. The second one, try all the passwords. Now what FuzzDB is, is it's just a bunch of lists of those types of things. Dictionary words, you know, common um, sets of rainbow table crack hashes. Yes, sir. I think it's correct to say a lot of this relies on having a web server in the middle. Absolutely. In other words, you have a form exposed to you know, the web Absolutely. browser person. Yeah. You have a database, and then you have a web server in the middle. And they, they work some of it because the web server is already connected to the database right. as a connected, logged in, approved right. process. Right. And then uh, they go through that connection to actually do the SQL. Right. Yeah, this is not something that you would do like from a command line. You don't attack a database server. If you have direct access to a database server, you're not doing SQL injection. You're going to do any number of other things, direct network file kind of thing. Um, I, I think that's where I get confused, because when I think of fuzzing, I think of attacking a service. Well, fuzzing is just buffer overflow conditions. Fuzzing is just doing like what SQL Mapper does, but it's a little bit more random. So you just have a password list of 10,000 common dictionary words. And I have to supply a password. So fuzzing is just poking and prodding. So yeah, this all of this stuff is, is web attacks. It is the web attack class. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, so back to defense. How do we defend against SQL injection? Anyone? Put a web source between your form and spiritual. So you, you limit which you yeah, actually goes to the Kind of have a, have a, have a yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of it was <coughs> cleared up by using a prepared statement. Prepared statements. Parameterization is the key word. If you had said parameterization, I had a thousand dollars back here for you. Um, I still clap for prepared statements. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> prepared statements, parameterization, store procedures, these are all things, depending on the DBA, depending on the flavor of database and the flavor of DBA that you get, they're going to like one or more of the others. In my experience, Oracle people hate store procedures, and Microsoft people always use store procedures. That's just, that's just what I see. Um, but your mileage may vary. Store procedures and parameterization of prepared statements are essentially the exact same thing, just in different places. The store procedure 
is on the database itself. And it is, a, it is an object that ex ex accepts parameters. So it would say string, B core C, length, not greater than 25. Password, curve level, length, not greater than 50. Right? So all of your fields have parameters for the store procedure. So when you pass, pass over an object, it breaks it apart, and you cannot put SQL injection there. Now, parameterized prepared statements is exactly the same thing, but it's done typically in the code of the application, maybe through some type of third-party library, like the hibernating framework, which does Java prepare something, JPA, Java persistence architecture. Java persistence architecture. So it's prepared statements in the application, but it does the exact same thing. Instead of building out a big long string, you have parameters, you know, string, decorsy, string, kerfluffle. And then when it when you try to inject SQL characters in those, it blows up because your strong data types say, you know, this this long cannot have a, an angle bracket in it. Um, I think there's also in configuration that you can tell your your database to just always interpret anything that comes in as text. As in there's no commands whatsoever. Yeah, you know, it depends on your how your database is set up, depends on what your application is doing. I've, I've heard of that. I've never done it in practice. Um, yeah, we'll have to look at that. Now, the hibernating. Sorry, we got to get close to wrapping up. I don't have the closing arm codes tonight, oh, okay. so we're racing the cleanup crew to get out. Okay. So, <coughs> all right. So the last one, I'll go through this real fast. The last one is, is CSRF, um, cross site request forgery. Um, you might say it wasn't in XSRF. Uh, SRF, no, it's CSRF. What about XSS? No, it's CSRF. <laughs> so, again, you don't really care what's between you and the server because this time it's just you talking to the web server. And it really only is a, a case of mistaken identity. You are saying that you are someone else besides yourself. So, as an attacker, you are attacking not necessarily the server, although that's your end goal, you are attacking the client. You are trying to get through some unwitting person in HR to click the link that you just sent in your phishing campaign. And you are saying to this person who, you know, I've done a little bit of research and I know that Jane in HR is always logged into the ERP system because maybe I'm an insider threat. You know, or maybe Frank in accounting is always logged into payroll. So I'm going to send a link to the payroll system that does things that I want it to do that are masked so that they don't know about it. And there, I know they're already going to be logged in, and I know that I have a fairly intimate knowledge of how the application works. And I've tested these things, and I know that in theory it'll work, but I just don't have the permissions needed to do it. But Frank in accounting does, so I'm going to send him this email say, hey, Frank, I'm having problems. Can you just take a look at it? And he says, sure, clicks the link. And you know, in a complex application like Web 2.0 Ajax mashups, you can do Ajax calls in the back to do web requests. So the, the page is doing something simple and Frank in accounting, Jane and HR say, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. And you say, okay, well thanks for trying. But they just did an Ajax web call that authorized you a $10 million raise. Um, so one thing that one thing that is absolutely deadly and very important in CSRF tax is the combos. <laughs> combos. So when you can combine CSRF with something else like session hijacking or cross-site scripting, it is it makes the two of them together, they're greater than the sum of the parts. And you can just absolutely own the application. So how do we defend against CSRF attacks? It's it's very simple, but not always very simple to implement. Every request and response needs to have a unique token that is unique. It's unique to the request, right? It can be or the session. Right, so or, or unique to the session. Yeah, so that way, whenever I send my CSRF through Frank in accounting, he clicks the link, and the server says, well, that doesn't have the CSRF token that you were using over here, so I'm not going to let that happen. Um, that, it just looks like it's, you know, I don't see the number I'm looking for, so you're not getting through. It's a bouncer. So OWASP CSRF guard is it's very simple to implement. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other methods. And if you have good developers who just homegrown your own system, as long as you use it, a unique token like a GUID or just some kind of weird string per session or per request, so that when the server gets it back, it says, 
that's, that's what I was looking for, go on ahead, or that's not what I was looking for, or it's not even present, you can't go ahead. Um, one thing we have found is that you have to do testing as the tester, the security tester, to ensure that the protections are in place. You can, you can enable stuff like CSRF guard and miss forms and you know, you're not have it protecting at all. Um, so it's, it's easy to get wrong. Um, but it's a very simple fix, just to put some unique out there. So, and then validate what they're there. And then validate, don't, don't forget that part. Yeah. <laughs> validate what they're there, yes sir. So the thing that you would say could be developed, simple and local, would be like the uh, web server, you're gonna connect to it, and I go, okay, we're great, we're, you've logged in. The next time you talk to me, send me this back. Yep. And so then your next transaction you has to send that back, and it goes, okay, that's great, here's your results, and this is what you're gonna send me the next time yep. in some field. Yeah, pretty much like and if you then got one out, just out of the blue, because you got it from somebody over there, yeah. they would, the server would say, what did you get that random issue yeah. number? It's no different from a TCP sequence number. Yeah. If we can now guess, think, every, every time you hear about a vulnerability where we can guess a TCP sequence number, it's bad news, right? So this is the same way. You, if you can guess that, you can own it. Yeah. Um, it's a session hijack tool, just like TCP yeah. sequence prediction. Yeah. Yeah. So except much worse because you've got application level rights. Yeah. Of whatever poor user just happened to get C certain right now. So I think that's it. Um, <laughs> if anybody has any questions. One, one so what do you think about web application firewalls, something like uh, mod security? They can, they can be very powerful. Um, I lump those in with stuff like DLP, and I don't want to get in trouble for saying this, HBSSS, yes. um, because they can be very powerful, yet they are often poorly implemented or not implemented at all. If you do it right, if you provide the care and feeding that they need, then it's all you need. But if you put it in place and turn it on and you know, drop the mic and walk out, then it's, you just waste the money. Mod security is mainly blacklist oriented, right? Where not to be what? Uh, mod security is mainly like blacklist oriented, so yeah. attacks have to be known for those to be blocked. Right, and I guess that, that was going to be my point is that you have to know enough about what the application is that you're hosting in order to configure it sufficiently and not so wide open that it's going to provide security more, right? Same thing with all those tools. And come to a standard set of like 4,000 rules for filtering, yeah. signal injection, sure. all such yeah. things. You know, but you got to tune it to, you know, it's like, it's like putting snore on your You know, it's like any other kind of monitoring tool. It's great if you got someone who cares about it, but it's exactly right on seconds. Well, yeah, I mean, you can set snore to yeah. You got somebody who cares about it, then it's great. You're gonna be just fine. Great. Thanks everybody for coming.